Hallelujah, glory, 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 Lord, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. You're worthy today. Worthy today, oh hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. Worthy to be glorified, worthy to be magnified, worthy to be worshipped, worthy to be lifted up, worthy to be exalted, worthy to be served. Hallelujah, God. You are worthy, Lord God. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending. You are the first, the last, which is, which was, and which is to come. You are all and in all and through all and above all and in us all. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your grace, your holiness, your mercy, and your blessings, Lord God. We thank you, God, today for everything you do, everything you are. Hallelujah, Lord God. For everything you do for us, Lord God. We give you the glory and we give you the praise today. I ask you right now, Lord God, in Jesus' name that you will continue to be miraculous in our lives. Miraculous, God. Miraculous in our new year, Lord God. And we thank you for that today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your favor today, Lord God. In Christ Jesus' holy name we pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah, Lord God. I want to thank everyone for coming today. What a glorious, ha, glorious day it is in the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord God. We just want to thank God for being with us. We want to thank God for, for touching our hearts, ha, daraka, touching our minds, focusing, helping us to focus, Lord God. I thank you for that today. We also are just rejoicing in the opportunity to seek God's face. Amen? To seek his face. Ha, koroshe daraka. To hear his voice. And we do thank you for that today. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, for hearing our voice and for letting us hear your voice, Lord God. For letting us speak to you, God. And that you have said, God, that you will. Hallelujah. If Christ is in us, that you will hear us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. God bless you. What a glorious, glorious day in the Lord it is today. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. Today's message is found in the seventh chapter of Isaiah. That is the seventh chapter of Isaiah. And the title of today's message is, you gotta believe. Amen? You gotta believe. Oh, hallelujah today. Begins in verse 1. Ha, Roshed Daraka. It says, In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. Oh, hallelujah, today. Ahaz is the, hallelujah, is the grandson of King Uzziah. Uzziah was a, or was the son of King Uzziah. He is, Uzziah was a good king, amen? He let pride, hallelujah, he let pride bring chastening from God, amen? That was his, his problem in, his, in that he, he was a good king. Everybody loved him. He, he, he really wanted to serve God. And then one day he decided, I'm going to go in the temple and I'm going to wave the censer and I'm going to do what, what I want to do in the temple. Oh, hallelujah. But the priests, they weren't having it. And worse than that, God wasn't having it. Amen? And the Bible says that God struck him with leprosy and he was leprous for the rest of his life. Oh, hallelujah today. So we just want to always keep in mind, we think that pride, you know, we talk about this pride and that pride and the other pride. If you belong to a group 
that wants to describe yourself by your pride, it seems to me like people ought to let these groups know that isn't the way to go. Amen? If you are too proud to hear God, if you are too proud to hear others, if you're too proud to hear when somebody's trying to correct you when you've made a mistake, you have a problem. But this isn't about Isaiah. This is about Ahaz. And unfortunately, Ahaz was not a righteous king the way Isaiah was a righteous king. Up until his time of being set down for his pride, hallelujah, at the time that Uzziah died, Pekah became king of the northern kingdom, where they call it, sometimes they call it Ephraim, sometimes they call it Israel, sometimes they call it the northern kingdom. And he joined with the king of Syria to attack his own brethren in Judah. Oh, hallelujah. Now, you know, God has an issue with you messing with his family. And he really has an issue with the idea of you messing with his lineage of his king. God told King David that there would always be one of his sons to sit on the throne. And it has really begun to, it has really bothered the Jews in so many ways because during the Roman time and on, there was no, hallelujah, no king from Judah to be able to sit on the throne. But God, oh, hallelujah today. Can you say that with me today? But God, God always makes a way. God always, hallelujah, has a remnant set aside. So it says here, that he joined with the king of Syria to attack his own brethren, and Ahab was the king that Pekah sought to defeat. Now, Pekah wasn't one of the kings of Israel, of the northern kingdom, by virtue of his lineage. Pekah was a king of the northern kingdom by virtue of treachery, because he killed the previous king. See, this is something else that you need to keep in mind is the fact that the northern kingdom no longer had people ruling that God had put in position. The people that they had in position were always one that were illegitimate as far as God was concerned. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. In Isaiah verse 7 and 2, it says, When the house of David was told Syria... The house of David. Now, when you hear the house of David, they are talking about Judah and Benjamin in the southern kingdom. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest before the wind. Ahaz was not a godly leader. He didn't know how to inspire the people. He led by just telling them, this is what you're going to do. But he wasn't a godly leader. He wasn't someone that could encourage the people, it's time to pray. He wasn't likely to call a fast when things got bad. He just decided, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. He was one of those people that did what was right in his own eyes and not in God's eyes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So because of that, and because he wasn't an inspiration to his people, when they heard that Ephraim and Syria were going to come and attack, because think about it, Ephraim has the ten tribes plus Syria, Judah has one tribe plus Benjamin, and it says that they began to shake and quake <clears throat> as leaves in the wind because of their fear. Why? Because they weren't really thinking about calling out to God. Why? Because there was no one to lead them. The Bible says that if you smite the shepherd, the sheep will flee. Well, what happens if you don't smite him? What happens if he's just wishy-washy, if he just flip-flops? Well, then the sheep are in a world of hurt. Even though they're still there, they're in a world of hurt. Verse 3, it says, And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz. You and Shear Jashub, your son, 
at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field or the washer where they wash the clothes, okay? Now, he was examining the water supply of Judah to make sure his enemies could not get to it. And God told him to take his son, Shir Jashub, whose name means a remnant will remain. Remember what I told you before, God always has his remnant. So his name was Shir Jashub, a remnant will remain to go and speak with him. That was Isaiah's son. And it says, and this is what God is saying to him. This is something we need to hear this. He says, God said to say to him, be careful, be quiet. So be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of a firebrand. Have you ever seen a firebrand? It's a bunch of reeds and things that are all woven together and you put pitch and stuff on it so it'll burn and you hold it up and it's a light. So it's a light and it leads people. People will follow a light. But in this particular case, God says they are smoldering stumps of firebrands. In other words, it has burned all the way down, almost getting ready to burn the hand of the person holding it. There's nothing left but coals. And it says here, these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and, oh yeah, the son of Remaliah. God won't even mention his name when God is speaking. In the first verse, they said, well, you know, this is the guy who's doing it and he's, and he's the king. But after that point, after identifying who he is and what his current position is, God simply calls him, hallelujah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah. Why? Because Remaliah is a nobody. Remaliah does not exist. And be, I mean, he existed as a human being, but he doesn't exist in history. He never did anything that he was identified with in history. And because of that, and because nobody really knew who he was, all we have to look at is his son. What's he doing? Well, he's going against God. And he's going against God's people. So God refuses to give him any kind of credit as being a real king in the northern kingdom. He wouldn't even name him. He just continually called him son of Remaliah, son of nobody. Isaiah 7 and 5, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah <laughs> has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it. Let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel, another nobody, as king in the midst of it. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. God acknowledges that their desire is to destroy Judah. Their desire is to take it over and put their own man in the on the throne. But he also says, it shall not stand. In other words, God looked at that and said, huh, not so, not so. And it says in verse 8, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. He was the king of Syria. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be, will be shattered from being a people. What a sad testimony that one of the tribes of Israel would be shattered from being a people. Amen? A generation and a half, no more, and it'll be gone. And in verse 9, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria. And the head of Samaria is that son of Remaliah guy. And I love this next. He says, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. 
Isaiah 7, 9, the second half, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. That's a bold statement from God. It's a bold statement. If you let your faith go, if you don't trust him to work things out, hallelujah, Lord God, then you will not, will not be firm at all. Verse 10, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Now God is trying to get Ahab to grow up in his faith. He's just said, if you will not be firm in the faith, you can't be firm at all. You're going to be wishy-washy in anything you do. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz saying, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol, as deep as the grave, or as high as heaven. I don't care, God says. Ask me anything and I'll do it. <laughs> Woo, think about that. What would you do if God offered you that? If God looked at you and said, I'm trying to be an encouragement to you. So I'm going to tell you now, ask anything as high as heaven or as low as the grave. Ask me to do it. Oh, hallelujah. Did you ever have a loved one that you lost that maybe died from, didn't die from old age or anything, but died from disease and, and God, you know, life took them too soon? or a sibling or something, and you said, Lord, fine, I want them back. But no, <clears throat> he has an offer to ask anything from God, anything at all, and he tries to get all holier than thou, all deep, and he says, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to a test. Well, there is indeed a scripture that says, do not put the Lord to a test. Have you ever acted really stupid? And your mother says, don't test me, boy. Don't test me. And you did it anyway, and you found out why she said, don't test me, or you found out why your dad said, don't test me and you couldn't sit down for a couple of days? That's what it was talking about. Don't test God by being disobedient. Don't test God by going against him. He said, never said anything about asking him for a miracle, okay? You think about that sometime. We hear about the sheep and Gideon put his fleece out and he put his fleece out and he said, Lord, let me come out in the morning and the fleece will be wet and the ground will be dry. And he came out in the morning and he wrung out the water. And he said, well, let, let me... That was easy because you just funnel the water to there. Let me come out and the ground will be covered in dew, but the fleece itself that's been laying there all night will be bone dry. And it comes out and it's soft and dry as it could be. See, even Gideon put God to a test when he, when he had fear, when he had doubt. I recall one time when I was out, it was very late at night, I was driving somebody to a bus depot and it was like three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning and all the interesting people were out there around the bus station and she had just, she was getting ready to go in, she had gone in to get her tickets and I was still waiting until she got on her bus and I'm waiting and I'm out there by myself. And I said, Lord, I can see. <laughs> I said, I know you're here protecting me, God. But I can see all these people. And they look a lot more frightening at the moment than, any, than my faith, apparently. And I said, I'd really appreciate you do something to encourage me that you're here watching over me. And I looked down the street and somebody came walking around the corner and was walking toward me. And I looked. They were wearing slacks and a really nice turtleneck sweater. And he got up there and he goes, well, Deacon Stubb, what are you doing out here? And it was Pastor Knight. Some of you know Pastor Barry Knight. This was his father. He says, what are you doing out here? And I, <laughs> I was too stunned almost to speak. And he was just out praying. He was out seeking the Lord and out praying 
His faith apparently was better than mine was at the moment. But God answered my request. He answered my prayer. And so it says here, ask a sign, high as heaven, deep as, as hell. And it says here, see, God set the terms. And so in verse 13, God's a little frustrated and he says, listen to me, O house of David. Now remember what I said, house of David was Judah and Benjamin. They were the ones that stayed in Jerusalem and for the most part lived more holy than the northern kingdom. And he says here, here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, but now you're going to weary God also. See, what your leaders do, God judges you for. Why? Because you're under them. That means that that's one reason why you need to pray for your leaders that you don't wind up getting a chastening when they get one. And so God shows more than a little bit of frustration for this, from this wayward king. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. God says, okay, you're not going to say it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to make it a toughie. God says, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Some translations try to change that. Well, a young woman shall bear a son. Well, young women bear children every single day. Hardly a minute goes by on earth without a child being born. It is a great miracle. The true translation says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now you have to understand something. When it talks about curds and honey, that is not necessarily, it's not a bad thing, but it's not a good thing. Eating curds and honey means you're poor, okay? That's sort of like us saying, well, you know, we're eating uh, spaghetti every single night. Whatever your food is that mom made for you because mom was trying to raise a bunch of kids by herself or, or because things were a little tight and this is what we were eating, that's what curds and honey were. He shall see what would happen was they would buy a cow or try to get a cow and then because the cow could eat anything and the cow would graze around and then it would give you milk. And so the cows were very valuable for their milk and because the milk, now the milk you couldn't put it in a fridge because you didn't have one back then. So you had to do something with it that would last and you would make curdled milk or curds or you would churn it up and make butter. So it says here, before he knows to receive, to refuse evil and choose good, the land those two kings you dread, the land wherein those two kings that you're so afraid of right now will be deserted, completely deserted. Now the funny thing is, if he had asked God for something more specific, God would have done it. If he'd asked something more timely, God would have done it. But because he angered God, God says, I'm going to do this thing because I want mankind to know what I did. But it isn't going to be in your lifetime because, frankly, you irritate me. Kind of like, go away, kid, you bother me. So it says here, and the Lord will bring upon you and your people and upon your father's house such days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So he's saying that the king of Assyria was going to come and not only would he afflict the northern kingdom, which he did and wiped it out, but he's going to afflict the southern kingdom as well. 
And it says in verse 18, In that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. What does that mean? Well, it turned out that one of the kings, I believe it was Hoshea, King Hoshea was put in position as a vassal of the northern kingdom. What does that mean? That means I tell you to jump, you ask how high. I come in every year and you give me my tribute. And I will let you and your nation live. But he got cute. He says, I'm going to go to Egypt and ask them for help. So Egypt, who is the fly, decided, okay, well, you're going to have to give us some of the tribute that you were going to give to him. But then Assyria went, sent somebody to Egypt and the Egyptian says, oh yeah, that Hoshea down there in, in Israel or up there in Israel, he's given us the money he was supposed to give to you. Well, guess what? That didn't go over very well with the king of Assyria. And so it says here, hallelujah, Lord God, that I will bring this upon you, that king of Assyria will come. So I'm sending you, I'm whistling, I'm calling for, Hallelujah, the fly that is in the end of the streams of Egypt and the bee. Oh, hallelujah. You don't want the bee. The bee that is in the land of Assyria. I think about that scripture that said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Uh-huh. Well, the sting of death was coming from Assyria. Hallelujah, Lord God. Verse 19 and they will come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and all the pastures. You have to understand about Samaria, it was a land, the northern kingdom was a land with a lot of hills, a lot of hillsides, and they built terraced, hallelujah, terraced areas where they would have vineyards and vineyards and vineyards and vineyards that would go down the mountainside. And so when they came, they went up to those mountainsides and they, and they dug and they burned and they chopped down and they destroyed all those beautiful vineyards that they had. They destroyed all the pasture land that was up there. And it says here in verse 20, In that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired. See, God could have punished them himself. But he was so angry that he brought somebody else in. See, the problem is when God wants to paddle your behind, you can cry out to God and he'll stop. But when God sends somebody else to do it, it doesn't do you any good to call out to them. They're not going to stop. And you have to pray enough for God to want to stop them. So it says here that he will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. What does that mean? Oh, hallelujah, today. He will shave the land for one thing, bald of flocks and people and produce. Only a remnant will remain and they will be very poor. He will completely wipe out the, when they used to kidnap them, they would shave their heads, even the women. They would shave the men's beards. They would shave them completely bald because it was considered a, a embarrassment to be, to not have hair on your body anywhere. And they would shave you completely bald and march you naked back to where they were from. So he will shave them completely. Only a remnant will remain, only the poor. Isaiah 8 and 1, it says, And the Lord said to me, Take a large tablet and write on it in common characters, Belonging to Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Belonging to Mahar Shalal Hashbaz. Hasting to the spoil swift to the prey, hasting 
to the spoil, swift to the prey. And it says, and I will get a reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah, that is Zechariah the prophet, by the way, Zechariah the prophet, son of Jer Jeberechiah, to attest for me. What do you mean? Well, there's going to be a wedding. And I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, call his name, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, hasting to the spoil, swift to the prey. For before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, before that child, that child, so nine months, plus however long it takes to be able to say, Mama, Daddy, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. Verse 5, the Lord spake to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah. You want to see something that's happening similar to this right now. They had an opportunity in Gaza to choose leadership that was going to bring them to great prosperity. But they didn't. They chose a terrorist organization to be their leaders. They chose them. They could have chosen somebody godly, but they chose a terrorist organization to lead them. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I know there's people out there that are going to say, well, that's all right, and you can go after the terrorists, but you should leave the civilians alone. Well, let me tell you something. According to God here, there's no such thing as a civilian because in verse Isaiah 8 and 6, because this people, what people? Any people. Because this people have refused the waters of Shiloh, that flow gently and rejoice over Rezin and the son of Remaliah, that God wouldn't even name him as king. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them of the waters of the river, mighty and many. So we're talking about the Euphrates River on the other side of that. And they're coming and they're sweeping across Oh, hallelujah, the king of Assyria in all his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and over all its banks. And it will sweep on into even Judah. It will overflow and pass on, reaching even up to the neck. So it didn't quite choke out the life of Judah. It only came up to here. It reached up to the neck and its outspread wings will fill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. Here's Emmanuel again. We know that the child they're talking about is Jesus. But this is talking about the land, Emmanuel. Because the land is the land of God with them. This happened after Ahaz was dead and Hezekiah became king of Judah. Unlike his father Ahaz, Hezekiah served God. He cried out to God and because of his prayers and crying out to God and because the king of Assyria mocked his God, God put a whisper in the ear of the king of Assyria and he turned around and he went back home thinking there was a bunch of problems back home and he had to go and fight those and he left Judah alone. After he had carried off Ephraim and Syria, he left Judah alone. Later, of course, Judah's sin became such that God sent the Babylonians to carry them off. But when they carried them off, they kept them as a people. They didn't scatter them to the four winds. They kept them as a people. Isaiah 8 and 9, Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear. All you far countries, strap on your armor, be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. 
Why? For God is with us. The only thing that saved Judah at that time was that Judah humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God. And God in his mercy heard their prayer and delivered them. Back to Isaiah 7, verse 21. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep because of the abundance of milk they give. So he's keeping them and he's keeping, he's, he's keeping them alive. He's not eating them for meat because that's only going to last you a couple of days. He's keeping them for the abundance of milk and he will eat curds for everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. There's nothing left. They have destroyed the pastures. They have destroyed the crops. All that is left, all that Assyria left them was the wild vines, blackberries, thorns, briars, all these wild vines. It says in verse 23, in that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels or more, briars and thorn. They had all these vines that were worth so much because the grapes were wonderful. You read about Israel sending the spies across and they came across and they had grapes that were so large that one cluster of grapes, two men had to carry them on a pole. And now it's all briars and thorns. Verse 24, with a bow and arrow, a man will come here for the land will be briars and thorns. It means there'll be wild animals there now because there's no men to keep them under control. It means that it's going to be a dangerous place because everybody will want to steal what you have because they have nothing. And every time you go around, you aren't going to be safe anymore. You will be carrying a weapon to protect yourself. As for the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for the fear of the briars and thorns, but they will be a place where your cattle are let loose to eat and your sheep tread. They used to produce much grain. They used to produce much fruit. Now they are briars and thorns. As for God's people in Israel, I mean in, in Ephraim, only a remnant shall remain. Those who say the ten tribes of the northern kingdom were lost, they're forgetting something really important. And that is the fact that the twelve tribes of Israel can't be broken up into countries. Because the twelve tribes of Israel are family groups. Okay? They are family groups. The tribes, the people in the tribes, they always maintain their family tree and they knew who they were. Why? Because it was important to them to know their genealogy. It was important to them to know what tribe they were from, whether they were scattered to the four winds. Most of them kept track of who they were, what tribe they were from. So Ephraim, Manasseh, Joseph, Issachar, all those ten tribes that are supposedly dust in the wind, they're not gone. Many of the people from those tribes came down to Judah before Judah was carried away, came down to Judah. Why? Because that's where the temple was. If they were godly, if they were holy, they wanted to live by the temple, so they came down to Judah. The very name of Isaiah's son, Shir Jashub, a remnant, will remain. Amen? Shows that God kept enough of the other ten tribes, either in Samaria or Judah or in the nations around the world, as specific family groups. Many say there is no way for those to be reconstituted into major tribes in Israel. But God says a remnant will remain. 
The Bible also says there is nothing too hard for God. And let us think back on what it said in verse 9. If you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. If you are not firm in the faith, you will not be firm at all. Amen? You got to believe, beloved. You have to believe. If you do not believe, God says to all those who believe, I am with you. The Bible says that I keep them in perfect peace, all those whose mind is stayed in on me. He says that if they will trust in me, if they will pray and seek my face, I will lead them and guide them and direct them. King David said, once I was young and I'm now old, have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, the righteous seed begging bread. Hallelujah, Lord God. Jesus might have been raised in a poor area. Jesus might have been raised in an area where they didn't have all the stuff they might have wanted. But Jesus was rich in spirit, powerful in anointing. He had the power of God in an unlimited amount. I want to encourage each and every one of you today, pray, seek God's face in this new year. Pray that God will direct you, he will guide you, and he will show you, hallelujah, he will show you who it is that he is and can be in your life. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your holiness, your mercy. We thank you for your promises today. You are King of all kings and Lord of all lords. You are Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending. You are the first, the last, which is, which was, and which is to come. You are all and in all and through all and above all and in us all. And I pray today, Lord God, help us to believe. Halo Roshed Daraka. As the man said that wanted his son healed, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. I thank you for your love, your grace, your holiness, your favor. We give you the glory and the praise today, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What I say unto one, I say unto all, watch and pray until we meet again. God bless you, beloved.